welcome everyone Hi, to GeoHug. Uh, so before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm so excited to have Ned Howard joining us today. Ned is the Principal Geologist for Technical at Evolution Mining, where he's worked for the last nine years. He specialises in geochemical and soil spectral applications to exploration and all body knowledge across a range of gold deposit styles. And I'm so thrilled that he's done in chat to us today about the geology of the Cal Gold Deposit and discovery of the Dalwini ore zone. So it is gonna be a great session. Please use the chat. We'll open up the floor and have some discussion at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Ned. It's wonderful having you. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. So today I'm going to give an overview of the geology of quite a large, uh, significant gold deposit in New South Wales, a cow gold mine, and talk a bit about a recent uh, near mine discovery of the, the Dalwini ore zone. So I'd also like to give an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which uh, Evolution, the company I work for, operates uh, in Australia and Canada, in, in particular the Wiradjuri people um, of the of the Cow region. I uh, pay my respects to elders, past, present, and future, um, who hold the memories, the traditions, and cultures, and hopes for Aboriginal and First Nations people. Uh, the usual forward-looking statement. So today I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the geological setting, starting at the, the regional scale and then, and then zooming in, talk a bit about controls and mineralisation before getting into the uh, discovery, making talking about some points uh, related to the discovery of the Dalwini ore zone. Uh, I'd also just like to acknowledge as well, um, thank Evolution for giving me the time uh, to, to give this presentation. Um, I've been here for almost 10 years now and had a, a great number of opportunities. It's been a, an awesome company to, to work for, really um, focused on people. So the Cow de Gold Deposit uh, is hosted uh, within uh, Eastern Australia uh, in central New South Wales, about 350 kilometres west, west northwest of Sydney in the uh, excuse me, Cambro Silurian uh, Macquarie Arc, uh, which is now divided into, into three segments, the Juni Narromine Belt through here, uh, the Molong Belt and the Rockley Golgong. Uh, and you can see the cow gold deposit hosted here in the southern part of the Juni Narromine Belt. Uh, the belt's best known for the earliest Silurian uh, alkalic porphyry copper gold deposits, uh, such as Cadia, uh, over here and parks. Um, but there's also an earlier phase of, of calcalcalic porphyry deposits and prospects, uh, including the Marsden deposit down here is probably the best example. And the cow gold deposit um, uh, hosted in the, the um, cow uh, igneous complex is the largest gold deposit in here in the, in the arc. So the Cal Igneous Complex uh, is the block of uh, approximately 20 by 40 kilometer block of Ordovician arc rocks. It's separated from younger rocks uh, to the west by the Bouveroy Fault through here and the Marsden Thrust uh, to the east. Uh, the southern part of the block uh, is composed mainly of uh, intrusive rocks ranging composition from diorite to granodiorite and monzonite. Uh, with lesser intermediate to mafic volcanic and volcanoclastic rocks, while the northern part of the block up through here uh, in these pale greens is um, composed mainly of uh, the supper crust, the intermediate to mafic volcanic and volcanoclastic and sedimentary rocks, and it's separated uh, along a, a cryptic but potentially metallogenically important Marsden lineament uh, that runs uh, west northwest through here. Most of the blocks covered. Um, with limited exposure around E39 uh, and with a well-developed deep regolith profile that provides good supergene dispersion of gold uh, and base metals. So the economic deposits uh, within this block are restricted to the gold corridor, which is through here, about a three by six kilometre north-south trending zone where we see a number of um, ore zones of quartz carbonate sulphide vein arrays that are interpreted uh, as intrusion related low sulph epithermal. Um, mainly to the south of there, we see a number of porphyry copper prospects 
including E43, E39, uh, and the faulted and eroded remnants of the Marsden Calcal Calic uh, Porphyry Copper Gold Deposit. It sits just in the hanging wall of the Marsden Thrust, near where the Marsden Lineament Cuts uh, runs through. Um, it has a modest resource now, but uh, before it was sliced and diced, uh, it was probably a, a world-class copper gold porphyry system. So the Macquarie Arc shows a protracted history uh, of uh, porphyry epithermal mineralization. So looking at this time space plot here, where we're just showing the, the, the Ordovician segment of the arc um, from, from early Ordovician through to the, the early Silurian. Uh, and then showing the geological histories of different parts of the belt, the Juni narrow mine through the Cow and Parks region uh, and comparing that over to the, the Molong belt um, where, where Katie is hosted. And so most of the, 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 the main porphyry copper, porphyry copper um, alkalic uh, deposits uh, that we see um, that the, the belts best known for occur in the earliest Silurian, uh, associated with an approximately 440 to 435 MA um, uh, period of, of alkalic intrusions and associated uh, gold copper porphyry deposits. Uh, they're probably formed during a relaxation period uh, within the Benambran origin. Um, that is probably associated with a, with a collisional event and uh, at the same time that we start seeing orogenic gold deposits forming in, in Victoria to the south. Um, so, but based on cross-cutting relationships and, and the geochron that we have from numerous uh, contributors at Cal, uh, it looks like the, the porphyry and epithermal style mineralization in the Cal igneous complex is part of an early event that's probably between about 463 to 450 million years ago uh, when we see more calcalcalic style uh, of, of porphyries. Um, so Marsden, which is, which is actually one of the oldest ones and other porphyry prospects um, that are between 460 and 455 uh, MA based on uh, Molly ages. So this event isn't well recorded in other parts of the Macquarie Arc, um, but accounts for all the known gold and copper mineralization in the Cal igneous complex so far. So zooming in now at the gold corridor where all the, the economic mineralization is, um, this is an oblique view looking down to the northwest um, with a transparent air photo that you can see showing the, the current open pit here uh, at E42, which is the, the only bore body that's been extracted thus far and the mine infrastructure. Uh, so the red, red areas here show the, the current resources uh, and you can see the overall um, uh, numbers there and those for the individual resources. So there's still quite some mineralization uh, remaining at E42, uh, in addition to the 4 million odd ounces that have been produced so far. Uh, we also have the, the GRE46 zone uh, over here, which is um, of which the, the Dow Winnie zone is, is part. Um, so that's where we've seen a, a great deal of resource expansion in the last few years. Um, plus, there's also other resources to the north and south at E46 uh, and E41. Uh, so the gold deposit, the gold was discovered here by Giapico in the late 1980s and on a second attempt brought into production by Barrick uh, in 2006. Uh, Evolution purchased the mine um, from Barrick in 2015, has been operating it since then uh, and seen quite some successful um, increases in mineral resources and oil reserves. So all the mining thus far has come from, from E42, um, but we're hoping to start producing from, or we'll be starting to produce from the GRE46 underground um, in the coming year. So looking at the geology now um, of, the, of the gold corridor, uh, on this map, you can see the resources again shown in the red polygons. So we've got E41, E40, uh, 42 and E46 uh, and the GRE46 uh, running down through here. So the stratigraphy of the gold corridor uh, is shown over on the right with this, this um, partial stratigraphic column. So we see here a sequence of dominantly intermediate uh, volcanic clastics, sedimentary and, uh, and volcanic rocks. Uh, with important units being the Dow Winnie andesite, which is a relatively thin uh, uh, pillowed andesite unit that sits within the coarser parts of some of the volcanoclastic sequence through there. Um, 
We've also got the Tracky andesite, which is Tracky andesitic to Tracky dacite in composition, some beautiful pepperidic textures uh, through there as well. And also the Muddy Lake diorite, which is uh, a variably semi-conformable fractionated uh, diorite to Monza diorite unit um, that hosts a lot of ore in E42. Um, and in, there intrudes the volcanoclastic sequence below the tracheandesite, um, but then we do see that um, further north intruding, crossing stratigraphy intruding above the tracheandesite unit. The volcanic, volcanoclastic sequence is, is folded uh, and through the, the gold corridor through here is generally moderately to steeply dipping to the west and northwest. Uh, with a possible fold hinge interpreted uh, over to the east, but um, poorly poorly defined by by drilling and then based mainly on on magnetic interp. Now uh, there's numerous faults that cut the the geology. Important ones being the subvertical north south oriented uh, Glen Fittich fault running down through here. Uh, and also the reflector fault further out to the east, uh, which is visible on the on the seismic, uh, hence the name, uh, and maybe a kind of structural domain bounding structure um, to the gold corridor um, structural domain. Uh, there's north south, northwest and northeast striking faults uh, associated with mineralization at E42 and also GRE46. Um, as we go from um, through the gold corridor, we generally see an increase in the preservation, both of the geology and hydrothermal features from south to north. Um, so where we're seeing more porphyry style uh, mineralization at the E39 prospect down here and exposure of, of more um, granitoid uh, stocks up to the northern end of the gold corridor um, where we see increasing preservation of um, some more acidic and lower temperature alteration assemblages um, higher up uh, in the stratigraphic sequence, which might be some structural feeders to a um, poorly preserved lithocap environment. So the intrusive history um, through the deposit, uh, we see a real range of, of, of intrusions, multiple different phases, many of them showing evidence of being, you know, quote unquote, fertile um, for porphyry uh, and epithermal style mineralization. So lots of evidence there of, of relatively uh, wet magmas formed originally in the deep crust and then um, repeatedly replenished um, and uh, fractionating with high water contents. Um, so most of these have been in place over about 20 to 25 million years from about 465 MA to about 440 uh, MA. Um, so with things like the Muddy Lake Diorite being some of the older ones, we see a range of, so Granite Diorite, Diorite, Monza Diorite, uh, and a whole range of dikes um, of varying composition, including some uh, in the stocks at E41 uh, with some evidence of, of mingling of some of those different composition uh, intrusions. Uh, associated with some of the porphyry prospects, we see a uh, quartz uh, feldspar biotite or hornblende porphyritic dacite. Um, probably uh, what's been uh, hypothesized to be not far off the, the time of mineralization, the epithermal mineralization that we see, uh, a, an intrusive polymictic breccia. We see a depth uh, underneath and in the side of the pit at E42. Uh, um, that's probably formed around the same time, some peroxine ferric dikes. Uh, and there's also some uh, quite niobium rich diorite porphyries to, to monzonite, monza diorite. Uh, porphyries that we see that intrude along and a poor mineral, poorly mineralized or cut mineralization um, along, but along faults that seem to be controlling alteration and mineralization in parts of the deposit, um, but with quite a distinctive geochemical signature. Um, so um, a lot of that's uh, a bit of this is summarized by a recently completed PhD um, by uh, Chris Leslie. Um, so some of his work on looking at the zircons and the fertility signatures there is, uh, is uh, described in the Jeremy Richards SEG special volume um, that, that's freely available um, and uh, due to be publishing the igneous petrogenetic work uh, in the near term. Uh, if we look now at some of the hydrothermal alteration features that we see um, throughout the belt, um, we do see some not associated with any economic mineralization, but um, some evidence of some probably relatively early formed uh, compared to the epithermal mineralization 
uh, and what are likely higher temperature, uh, calcic to um, to potassic sodic uh, alteration assemblages that are that um, we'd normally associate with being being an intrusion proximal within the porphyry environment. So we see garnet bearing um, calcic uh, alteration assemblages in places, often replacing more more mafic rocks. Uh, that's an example of of magnetite biotite. Uh, things like actinolite, magnetite, albite, um, sometimes uh, overprinted, replaced by by uh, by chlorite case bar, uh, and also some quite pretty um, patchy epidote case bar alteration as well. Um, I should mention um, a lot of the this works were originally um, defined by um, Wojciech Zakowski from his PhD um, back in 2010, but then then published in SEG in um, 2014, um, but but holds true for the general relationships um, throughout the broader area. So then, looking at the um, the types of alteration that we see associated with the with the gold mineralization, um, generally we see uh, as we get um, closer to the deposit, you see. What's what's generally epidote destructive uh, alteration though? Though epidote's um, quite a common alteration mineral as as part of general quite unquote propolytic uh, alteration that we see throughout the sequence, um, particularly uh, more in, in in more mafic rocks like the diorite and such. Um, but associated with mineralization, we can see a range of of alteration assemblages that vary from from chloritic, so um, with um, chlorite, calcite, plus minus sericite, pyrite through to um, more uh, paler, more bleached um, sericite, uh, anchorite, pyrite uh, alteration assemblages, um, which have a closer spatial association with, with mineralization and also with, um, with uh, faults that look like they were, they were probably um, associated with, with uh, the stage of mineralization. So you see um, blowouts in sericitic alterations through those, uh, also in more felsic lithologies. Uh, and you do see uh, sericitic uh, alteration uh, selvages around mineralized veins uh, in a number of parts of the deposit. Um, though there are, um, though a lot of the time you see uh, mineralized veins that do not have any selvages and uh, don't necessarily have a close spatial relationship uh, with, with sericite. Uh, sericitic alteration assemblages. Uh, in, in some parts, particularly some of the more felsic lithologies like the tracheandesite or intermediate to felsic, uh, you see uh, can get this kind of buff colored alteration as you get close to, to some of the larger vein uh, sets um, where we're seeing increasing either albite or, or case bar. Um, it, it can be can be either in, in different cases uh, close to those uh, insets. Uh, and in some places, some, some fault controlled, likely lower temperature and slightly more acidic alteration uh, where we see um, paler, more bleached uh, illite anchorite plus minus kaolinite dikite, though that's um, quite restricted to, to structures. So uh, looking at the, the mineralization, um, while most of the veins in the deposit are mineralogically and texturally similar, there is a zonation of vein mineral assemblages spatially and through time. Um, Cross-cutting relationships uh, aren't common, but um, and may be uh, a bit ambiguous and, and contradictory with multiple cross-cutting relationships in places. Um, so this is kind of more of a general evolution that we're seeing on this image here from um, the styles over on the left to, to over on the right, but we do see um, phases cross-cutting each other. Um, so in places in E41, as documented by Zukowski, excuse me, we do see um, all stage veins, quartz pyrite carbonate veins that do have epidote uh, within them and associated in, in alteration assemblages and some reddening um, hematitic uh, alteration uh, selvages and also um, uh, seeing agillaria and, and, and other potassium feldspar varieties uh, within the vein assemblage and in alteration selvages. The most common types of veins that we see in terms of uh, contribu contribution to the deposits 
uh, where we see more sericidic uh, halos and associated where we're in, and, and without, uh, you know, things like epidote as part of the assemblage, but uh, quartz carbonate, um, where that carbonate generally varies from, from anchorite through to probably uh, manganoan um, calcite. Um, associated with a little bit of agillaria here and there, uh, and with um, uh, with pyrite being quite a common uh, sulfide mineral, uh, and then associated um, varying um, base metal sulfide, so chalcopyrite, um, sphalerite, galena, um, with sometimes a little bit of arsenopyrite, sometimes a little bit of telluride um, and, and rare um, sulfur salts. In some parts of the ore body, we also see a significant proportion of the mineralization associated with uh, pyritic uh, veinlets and dissemination, such as the Dalwini ore body through here. Um, we also see, which look like they're, they're probably towards the end of the paragenesis, we see some uh, episodes where there is more carbonate base metal style veins um, with, with less quartz in them and significantly more sphalerite and galena. The sphalerite can vary through the deposit from being relatively iron rich, almost white, as in that example there. Um, yeah. And we do see some kind of breccia veins, uh, which are uh, termed QSBs, quartz sulfide breccias, uh, at the mine. So to have a look at what some of the ore actually looks like, this is a pretty typical kind of ore interval from, from cow. So while, so the gold ore there is usually consists of relatively low density vein arrays or stockworts of, of the quartz carbonate um, sulfide veins, um, typically with relatively coarse grained um, with extensional to um, extensional shear uh, opening. Uh, and are often mineralogically banded uh, with pyritic disseminations and stringers, as I mentioned, um, can uh, contribute significant mineralization in places. This is an example of a, of a shallow dipping vein with, with um, bands of pyrite growing preferentially along the, the lower part of the vein there. Um, we also see in some parts of the deposit, the, the QSBs or, 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 or more prominent vein zones where we see larger veins and often multi-stage veins um, but, but still generally less than about 50 centimetres width, um, such as this one here underground. This is um, Ben Reed, um, one of the, one of the, the geos on site. Um, so looking at a multi-stage vein there underground in the, in the GRE 46 ore body. Um, so that's just an example there showing the, the multiple different um, mineralogical phases of veining that we can see all coming up through the, the same structure. We do also see some, some barren or weakly mineralized uh, later phases where we see some really anchorite rich, often very well tarnished um, uh, breccia veins, um, some late uh, crustiform banded um, calcite uh, plus minus hematite, and also there's a later um, epidote bearing vein event that, that cross cuts the, the ore stage veins as well. So the geometry of the, the ore bodies and shoots are controlled mainly by the distribution of veins and the, the vein, and, and importantly, the vein density uh, and volume. Um, and, and that varying um, through space. So important geometries are controlled by a number of elements of the geology. So, I mean, there, there is the first order control on the deposit of the, the north-south orientation defining the gold corridor, uh, second order northeast and northwest trending faults such as the Galway and Manor in GRE 46 or the central and western faults in, in E42. Um, lithological contacts are clearly important, especially where they uh, represent rheological contrasts between um, brittle and softer bodies and importantly kind of isolated brittle units between softer ductile lithologies, um, adjacent structural buttresses as we see um, the Dalwini andesite um, uh, and also the tracky andesite lava in E42. Uh, then there's the, you know, the actual ore hosting structures, the steeper dipping uh, QSBs or vein zones, um, which are likely originally you know, low displacement faults or fracture systems uh, and shallowly to moderately dipping extensional veins. So I, I guess I kind of visualize, as, visualize these as forming a, a loosely hierarchical kind of structural fluid flow mesh 
um, through which um, the, the ore fluids and flowed over a relatively large area, producing some very high grade veins. So you only need one or two veins a metre to get you a couple of grams. So veins may be running off in you know, hundreds of, of grams themselves, but with the relatively low vein densities uh, as a result of that more distributed fluid flow. Um, so you end up with a, overall a, lo a lower grade ore body on average. Um, so at E42, uh, Amber Henry's defined a, a structural history of normal faulting and dike emplacement, uh, as we can see uh, represented in this diagram here, um, uh, where that's then followed by uh, steep, um, the, the steep uh, formation of steep QSBs uh, and, and vein zones, often associated with, the, with those pre-existing uh, normal faults, followed by uh, a stress state from that likely extensionally dominated stress state to, to a more of a compressional regime uh, within which we get the, the more shallowly inclined, so shallow to moderately dipping uh, inclined vein sets. Though you do see cross-cutting relationships. So it's, again, this is, looks like it's a, a broad pattern rather than necessarily discrete events. So having a look at the uh, gold deposits uh, themselves now uh, at Cal, uh, we've um, here with this is a, a map zooming in on the, the E42 deposit, which is approximately here. You can see the, the approximate pit outline there, stippled, uh, and then the GRE46 uh, deposit over here. So this map shows uh, the local geology of that. Um, so you can see E42 is hosted in a sequence of, of moderately dipping, um, openly folded volcanics and volcanoclastics. Um, so where we see mineralization through pretty much all the rock types. So we've got the fractionated uh, muddy lake diorite uh, down through here. Uh, and then a sequence of volcanoclastics with the blue showing the tracheandesite lava through there. So that's been cut by a number of um, north uh, west uh, trending steep faults uh, that display normal movement. Um, at the top right, you can see GRE 46, um, including the, the Dalwini ore zone um, about through here, which is hosted within more steeply dipping, dipping volcano sedimentary sequences uh, against the contact of the Mons Diorite uh, on the eastern side of the prominent um, Glen Fittich fault through here. So to look at that in section now from southwest to northeast through, uh, you can see E42 over here and then um, GRE46 over here. Um, so the tr pink transparent field through here shows the approximate um, one gram gold contour. As you can see, all the pre-mineral lithologies can be mineralized, um, whether in the uh, vicinity of, of fluid flow. The, the tracheandesite lava does tend to have higher average grades, uh, as well as in the more fractionated parts of the Muddy Lake diorite shown through here. Uh, the central and western faults and other normal faults uh, often host um, uh, stronger um, sericitic alteration associated with them and, and, uh, and sometimes um, higher densities of all stage veining. Though there is a, a variable relationship there. Um, so to the east of the, of the prominent um, Glen Fittich fault through here, uh, you can see the um, much narrower but still relatively wide uh, ore body overall. Um, uh, at GRE 46 associated with um, the Galway Faults uh, series um, against the contact of the Muddy Lake Diorite uh, and associated with the Dalwini Andesite. So if we have a look now at the GRE 46 ore body, um, so this is a, a, a plan um, uh, map here um, showing the approximate position of the, of the, the broader mineralized domain in red dashed. You can see that that's running along the edge of the, of the Monza diorite shown in pink. In, pink. Um, in the northern part, mineralization hosted mainly in the tracheandesite and to the south, mainly in the uh, volcanoclastics uh, and, and the Dalwini andesite and a little bit in the diorite as well. Um, while the alteration mineralization blows out in association with the uh, Norna West and Norna East striking um, Galway and Manor um, faults, 
uh, the overall trend of the mineralization is, is pretty north-south along that contact of the Muddy Lake diorite. So if we look at that long section now from some south to north through there, you can see the Endeavour and Regal zones, uh, which are hosted in the uh, tracky andesite lava. Um, and through there, we see a more prominent control of the steeply south dipping QSB. So producing these relatively steep plunges uh, in the mineral resource shapes you can see through there. Whereas in Dalwini and, and Galway, um, we see uh, less uh, prominence of those um, mineralized structures and, uh, and different sheet geometries. So this is some of the, the mineralization uh, that we see um, in the northern part of GRE 46 through Endeavour and Regal, where we're seeing more of these QSBs, um, steep you know, vein zones and QSBs. Uh, that's an example of a, of a nice one there. Uh, and we also see between the Manor and Ardbeg faults, much more pervasive sericitic alteration in the deeper parts of, of Regal through there. So that's just showing some, some typical mineralization and note that we've got some, some really nice high grades there, even though we've only got about 5% um, vein density through there. So if we have a look through, this is now a cross section, looking to the north through the southern part uh, of the of the ore body, where we see um, the, the the Galway zone up here and then the Dalwini zone um, below at um, deeper RLs, excuse me. So while the mineralization's again broadly associated with the contact of the diorite, um, it's hosted mainly within the volcanoclastic sequence in the Dalwini andesite with blowouts in the thickness of mineralization associated with um, where we see intersection with the, the Galway splay uh, and where we are seeing um, the presence of the, the Dalwini uh, andesite unit flexing around where we're seeing undulations in, in the contact of, of the diorite, even though the diorite in these areas may not be well mineralized. Uh, they look like they're, they're really important um, controls on, on where we're seeing shoot development and, and those overall plunges where we're seeing those flexures. So some of the mineralization through the Galway zone um, in, the, in the upper parts, uh, where it's more tightly controlled uh, around that Galway fault. Um, and we see some, some nice mineralization here, but still some, some support with increased um, vein density of those, those uh, more dilated and inclined vein sets uh, around that. Uh, and then in the Dalwini zone, where through the, the Dalwini uh, andesite, uh, we see um, a, a higher proportion of the ore uh, associated with, with more pyritic, uh, more pyrite rich veining uh, and also disseminations and, and replacements through there. So, so this stuff here is, is running close to 20 grams. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the, um, the uh, geochemistry, which might be a little bit of a surprise to some people, but the, the elements that we see associated best with gold uh, silver, uh, tellurium, and, 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 and sulfur. Um, there is you know, some significant gold uh, associated uh, in sitting in, in um, phases of pyrite uh, and also associated with tellurides. But so usually we see you know, one gram of gold uh, usually uh, approximates to about one ppm of silver, one ppm of tellurium, and about 1% sulfur. Uh, we do see some broad mineralogical zonation through the deposit, um, but with gold can be associated, um, you know, throughout throughout that geochemical zonation. Um, but where we see generally, you know, to the to the south and deeper, uh, a little bit more um, dominance of copper over other base metals through through zinc and lead as we tend to go up and out through the deposit. Uh, there is some significant post-mineral deformation, though usually it's relatively low displacement. So we see relatively common uh, late slip planes uh, and, and, uh, and small reverse faults such as these cutting this mineralized vein uh, and resulting in, in foliation and deformation of the earlier formed ore veins through there. Uh, around some of the main faults, we see you know, multiple stage histories where we've got foliated cataclasites uh, and also um, later, later pugs um, showing a um, uh, range from, from kind of compressional, transpressional to, to uh, 
uh, extensional um, movement generations. There have been probably four kind of uh, erogenies uh, happen post mineralization. So um, yeah, there's there's there is a bit of post mineral deformation there. So I guess overall, for a bit of a, a, a summary. Um, uh, would interpret the uh, the cow gold deposit as a uh, intermediate sulfidation or intrusion related low sulfidation epithermal deposit, depending on what classification scheme um, you like. But generally formed within a you know an intrusion related environment um, in a in a porphyry epithermal overall mineral system. Um, so similar to what what we'd see here in this diagram um, from from Cook et al. Um, occurring and adjacent and you know can uh, overprint these these uh, uh, more intrusion proximal alteration assemblages. Um, so we see certainly an association with the upper levels of a multi-phase intrusive complex with all the diking and, and stocking that we see around with a favorable uh, igneous geochemistry, changes in stress state and probably an association with um, with a an event, probably a some kind of a collisional event in that um, late Ordovician uh, that's resulting in perturbations of the production, the subduction process. Um, controls at the larger scale from belt parallel and belt oblique structures. Um, and you know, formation of the deposit itself by moderate to low temperature, near neutral to weakly acidic um, pH. Um, fluids that are uh, low to moderate salinity in an epizonal environment. So, but where we're seeing gold forming over quite a significant vertical range, which is um, not uncommon for this style of, of mineralization. So we we're probably seeing economic gold occurring over about a, a kilometer vertical. Um, uh, it's cow's been talked about as being, being our calic. Uh, in the past, I mean, uh, all the phases of intrusions are kind of somewhere between medium K, calcalkalin and, and, and shoshinitic all throughout the, uh, the Macquarie arc. Uh, I'm not, it's not clear to me that, um, you know, there's definitely a need to put an alkalic label on cow. There is an association with, with uh, mineralization here with, uh, with relatively low um, uh, delta 32S um, which is a characteristic that's been seen at Cadia and, and North Parks and a bit of an association with Tullurium, um, but, but not you know, uncommon to, to other similar deposits of this style. I'd say Bruce Jack in British Columbia is a, is a pretty good an analogue for the cow deposit, though um, they tend to get some, some even crazier grades up there. Um, so now I was just going to talk briefly about the discovery of the Dalwini or zone, uh, which is a near mine discovery that's provided a number of lessons, I think, for, for brownfields exploration um, and hopefully, well, will be uh, a mine uh, uh, within four years of discovery. So Evolution purchased uh, the cow gold operation in 2015 and became an immediate flagship asset for the from an ailing barrack at the time for who the operation wasn't a priority. Uh, in 2017, during a long-term planning review, the decision to re-evaluate the previously defined E46 deep ore zone shown here on this south to north uh, long section down the, the Galway Regal Corridor. Um, so that led to a maiden underground inferred resource uh, of about 600,000 ounces of gold uh, without having drilled a hole, but with the recognition there that, you know, it's very much in the inferred category um, that, you know, discrete um, explicit modelling wasn't really doing the job um, for, for modelling the geology properly and that there was some, some real issues with um, the orientation of drill holes, which were running down some of the main veins. Uh, commonly. The second thing that came out of that was, you know, the, the recognition of the opportunity to the, the south of that, um, where that corridor had been poorly drilled to the south, uh, where mineralization, where we were, we uh, lost the, um, the tracheandesite lava unit um, that had previously been considered a, a, a quote unquote, you know, preferred host. Um, so there was a recognition of the need to, to test that area. Um, so there were a couple of understandings that um, were important in informing that and also guiding and speeding up um, the, the discovery uh, of the Dalwini zone through there. Um, so 
um, early on in those programs, there was uh, the interception of a of a narrow high grade hit to the east of the known mineralization, the known resources, the E46 that was hosted in a narrow andesite unit, the Dalwini andesite, um, with the help of uh, a consultant, John Doe, that was recognized um, by the, the ResDef team there, um, of which um, key people were, were uh, Tila Milosevic and, um, uh, and Ben Reed, uh, amongst a number of others. Uh, they recognised that correlated with other high-grade intercepts um, further to the north. Interestingly enough, that area hasn't um, gone into a resource yet, but did lead to the recognition of that, um, that position in the stratigraphy being a potentially a favourable trap site for drilling further south. So uh, stepping out drilling to the south along that long section um, uh, in this uh, area out here, um, there was uh, a, a, a nice hit um, from drill hole 330, which intersected the newly recognized uh, Dalwini andesite uh, with a higher grade intercept of about seven and a half, gram, uh, seven and a half meters at 10 grams that opened up you know, a 500 meter area that had been very poorly drilled previously. Um, between um, between the drilling to the to the north and and that hit. A uh, key contribution to realizing discovery was building a uh, a well geologically constrained and iteratively updatable three D model of the deposit in Leapfrog um, and hosted in in uh, Leapfrog Central, so that it could be shared and used amongst the team. Um, with um, Clemens Organstein um, providing you know, a lot of help early on to, to get that set up and that approach, um, that approach going. Uh, this led to the, an understanding of the importance of the subtly plunging uh, inflections in the contact of the diorite shown here in this, this overall blue unit, but where the, the, the faces are, are colored by the, by the dip angle of that face. So where you can see those moderately subtly plunging uh, orientations through there and also in the, in, in the lava. Uh, and those being an important control and where we're seeing better vein density and blowout. So larger and higher grade uh, ore zones. So that, that was important in providing more confidence to step out to the south and test, test those, those projections. So um, after the hole 330 was drilled, there were a couple of other holes in the area that, that weren't, didn't have quite as good uh, results, uh, but a hole was planned to, to follow up the area to, to give it a, a proper test. Um, but with restrictions on available drill pads, um, as you know, those of you who have worked in a mine environment will know a lot about the, the compromises you need to make um, when, when you're looking to test targets, um, meant that there was a risk in the orientation of the drilling and also a limited window um, of time. But, um, but Ben and Tillon on site really persisted to, to get that hole drilled and it turned out to be a cracker. So that's hole 348. Uh, which got an intercept of 46 metres at 7.8 grams. So it's so a really great intercept there. And that, was, that intercept was, was important in really solidifying uh, the significance of the mineralizations through that area um, and um, you know, leading to a real uh, strong effort to, to drill that zone out uh, as quickly as, as we could. Um, so that drill hole cemented the discovery of Dalwini as, as a new zone. Um, and um, in the preceding time, uh, we've seen the mineral resource there go from the original 600,000 ounces to about 3 million ounces and with, a, with an underground reserve of 1.1 million ounces. So one of the, one of the key contributions to that, um, to bringing that discovery forward and also focusing the subsequent resource drilling um, was the use of drill hole orientation measurements on mineralized veins in conjunction with that dynamic and uh, collaborative, collaborative 3D geological model in, in Leapfrog and hosted on Leapfrog Central. Uh, the vein orientations that were recognized to be critical throughout the, the discovery history um, were um, you know, a little bit problematic uh, because from ore zone to ore zone, you know, the, the dominant vein orientations do change. So when you look at the data as, as a group, you get you know, something like this, which is really doesn't 
you know, give you a lot of help in, in defining what the main controls are and what orientation you should drill from. Um, but, you know, with, with re refining that data, collecting the right data and um, being able to split it out into structural domains in an interactive way in that 3D environment, uh, meant that you know the the, the dominant vein sets are uh, as shown by these stereo nets in different um, structural domains through the deposit allow the optimal drill angles to be defined, and so that was really important then in uh, informing you know both the um, yeah the the drill orientations the the underground development and all of that and and a really key part of allowing the time frame and also the costs to reach particular mine decisions to be to be minimized with that with that input of that um, uh, good geological understanding um, and and modern software um, yeah so that's that's an example of you know just showing those 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 orientations and how they vary through the deposit and a, and a, and a key uh, bit of work there that by Till and Milojkovic. Uh, so uh, to summarise, um, the, there's a number of in contributing factors uh, to the discovery of, of the Dalwini zone. Um, uh, you know, it is a, it is a near mine uh, discovery, but um, there's a really important geological contribution to that, and uh, is is uh, certain and preordained and linear as. Uh, discovery stories may seem in the telling later on, they are rarely that way in reality. And, and this is no different uh, as, as Ben's reminded me, um, but in co important contributors uh, to this were a renewed uh, interest in near mine exploration at Cal with a change in ownership and the strong support from leadership to invest in the growth opportunities there, the building of that 3D geological model, uh, the system scale in, in Leapfrog and incorporating good geological insights into that. Um, and allowing you know rapid um, response to new drill information, um, changing of complicated geometries uh, through the ore body, uh, and also with site geological leadership at the time with Dean Fredrickson and then James Bigham, um, empowering geologists to do the work to make real time decisions and, and modify the drill programs based on what they're seeing in the rocks rather than just you know sticking to the pre designed program, uh, and of course a healthy dose of of persistence. So um, look, I've given this presentation, but um, you know, really, you know, the work uh, has has come from a lot of different people who've contributed to the understanding of the geology of the deposit uh, over time, uh, and who've contributed uh, importantly to to the discovery of that Dalwini ore zone. So there's there's a number of people um, listed there who've who've made some some great contributions recently. Though you know there's there's a lot more who've contributed to the understanding of the deposit over time. Uh, a couple of consultants there, um, John and Clemens, and, and another John, uh, and you know a number of researchers, um, usually supervised by by David Cook. Um, out of codes and UTAS uh, who've contributed to the geological understanding over the years. So um, thank you very much, everybody. I will call it there.